Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Fisher's Point Community Church. It's wonderful to have you in the house of the Lord today. We are so thankful to have uh, Dr. and Reverend Joy Wife, uh, Liddy and Joy Wife. Sorry, there you go. I'm already messing up and I just got started. So uh, as our special speakers today, uh, so we're, we're going to introduce them a little bit more later on, but they have a word from the Lord for us today. I have a few announcements. Uh, to share with us as we get started. First, if you look around you, you might see a connection card. If you can go ahead and fill out that connection card and drop it in the offering uh, basket later on. On the back, you might see some questions about, do you want us to pray for something? Uh, do you have a, a message to get to one of the pastoral staff? You know, things of that nature. As we're talking about prayer, I ask that you please pray for uh, Janet Bishop, who would normally be here. I point this way because this is normally where, where she sits. Uh, but she came back from a trip and she's very, very ill. Um, she doesn't know if it's COVID or not or, or whatever, but she's, and she has a lot of risk factors from having cancer and all of that. So, so I ask that uh, you pray for Janet. Um, some announcements for us today. Uh, men's breakfast will be this Saturday, August 5th at 8.30 a.m. So if you are interested in that, if you have any questions, you know, contact Dale Wayman here in the back. We have breakfast at Perkins. Uh, we have time of fellowship. We have prayer. We have a devotional. It's just a wonderful time. And uh, we, we love razzing each other, but also learning about the Lord as well. So... Also, we continue to collect items for school pal packs during July and August. So, uh, school pal packs provide students in Nazarene primary schools with the supplies they need to facilitate learning. We have several items left over from last year's purchases, so you may purchase um, so you may purchase bulk of one item, fill a bag, or make a monetary donation. We'll be happy to take that. Um, bags and business cards listing the exact items needed are on the table as you enter the foyer. Finally, the Nazarene missions trip is being planned for July 11th through the 18th, 2024. Participants will be going to Panama and the estimated cost of the trip is around $2,000 and the $100 deposit is due by August 20th. For more information, you may contact Holly Williams, and we can give you her contact information. Um, and it's not on the slide, actually, but it, it, it will be um, here in the coming weeks. So, uh, but it'll also be in the newsletter. So as we continue today, I wanted to step, step aside here and uh, call up uh, Dr. Weishart. If you could come up and talk to, talk to us a little bit about the book. Okay, you know, yeah, you can sit there. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, a friend of mine once said, I've only been with you for a little while, and already I feel like one of you. Uh -huh. Then he said, whichever one of you it is, I feel like, please go home and get some rest. You need a nap. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't feel that way. We are just, we're excited to be here. What a privilege to be here with you and with Pastor Landon and just the wonderful presence as well as the spirit of this place. 
you know, it doesn't take us very long to be in a place. You can pick up on the spirit inside a congregation. We, we sense that. Uh, how many of you have a devotional book at home? When you see devotional books, yeah. I have probably uh, 20 or 30 devotional books in my library. I don't like devotional books that tell me stories about going to Uncle Charlie's, going down the creek and fishing in the pond. I don't care about that. I want you to remind me of a scripture or give me an insight into a passage. How many of you remember Matthew 4, where Jesus, the greatest person that ever lived, encountered Satan, the greatest foe? Remember the great temptation? Remember that. What did Jesus do when he was tempted? He was the Son of God. Anything he said would have been scripture because he's the Son of God, right? right. What he did, get this now, he's face to face with Satan, and he quoted Deuteronomy. Can you beat that? It was written 1,500 years before then. Instead of saying something from his heart and mind, the Son of God, he quoted Deuteronomy facing Satan. Come on, it is written, it is written, it is written. At the end of his life on the cross, what did he say? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You think he made that up? He quoted the Psalms. Jesus knew there was something powerful and prayed the written word. I don't want to improve on that. I just want to get in on that. I want to pray the word of God. There's power in praying the word of God. That's the actual first devotional in this book. That's what they're like. They take a scripture, they apply them to it. This book has 493 scriptures in it. It's a 365 day devotional. All 493 scriptures are listed in the back. If you're reading in Matthew and you want to see if I say anything about it, you go back there. Oh, yeah, April 21st he did. It's kind of a cross reference. And uh, I'll tell you what, two things. If you buy this book, they're available back there in that back room. And if I've got coffee for the score, you all that back there. <laughs> <laughs> if you buy this book, two things. If you read it 30 days and you feel like the Spirit of God has not touched your life, you let me know, I'll refund all your money back. Secondly, I'll tell you, you don't know a good book when you see it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. So uh, we're, we're excited to, to hear you bring the word of the Lord to us today. As we continue in our worship service today, would you please stand with me? And I'm going to offer a word of prayer. <clears throat> Father, we are so grateful for you today that, that you're here. We ask that you bless us. Bless us with music. Bless us with the word. Bless us with fellowship, Lord. We just we just want your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. So today, Lord, we just ask that you pour your Holy Spirit out upon us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. good morning. This first song is probably somewhat familiar to you, a thousand times. But there's a little twist. There's a new chorus that was written for it. So if you don't know that right away, it's pretty easy to pick up on. So shall we sing together? Oh, for a thousand times to sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His praise. Jesus the name, Jesus the name that charms our fears, that bears our sorrows free. Oh, 
today in in the offering. Uh, Carl, would you pray for us as we receive offering? Sure. Father, thank you for the gifts you give us. Thank you for the way you support us and for your forgiveness. We ask, Lord, that the, you would take these gifts that we give back to you, multiply them, and use them for the furtherance of the kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray for you. Amen. Before we get to the next song, today is really special for me because... Pastor Weisheart and his wife Joy, also Pastor Weisheart, were my pastors for 13 years. In fact, Joy Weisheart did Christie's and my pre marriage counseling. So we go way back, and this is really a treat for me to be. <laughs> you know what I mean? Another? Yes. <laughs> Would you stand with me as I try to lead us in another song? <laughs>
Jesus, to gather in your name in response to what you have already done in our lives, in response to who you are, in response to your kindness as we read in your word, it's your kindness that leads us to repentance. God, I ask that you would move in this place, that you would prepare hearts and minds for what we're about to hear through your servant. And God, I ask that by your Holy Spirit, not by our effort, but by your Holy Spirit and our cooperation, that we would leave different than we came. We would be closer to you today than we were yesterday. And as my pastor, Dr. Weishart, used to say, that we would keep the main thing the main thing. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 What a privilege to be here with you, new friends, and friends. I think Sean has always had a heart for the things of God. It's really a blessing. I sit under your ministry. Thank you. And it's amazing how much he can say without saying anything. <laughs> he just kind of goes, and we all know what he means. It's so good. I can't do that very well. But uh, he's always had a precious spirit. I love him and his parents and friends that are here. My, my, I'm so glad. I'm sure they're all going to be bigger or something. <laughs> um, it is a privilege to be with you. Joy and I are on the road full time. We've passed for 30 years, but now we're approaching 25 years on the road. And uh, we love it. When I was 14, the Lord called me uh, to evangelism and sanctified me at the same time. And it's been a thrill to be a part of that these years. But Joy, you know what? I want us to tell us a little bit about ourselves. Tell them about your background. Okay, that's enough. Now, <laughs> <laughs> this is massive. Is this, is this good? We're okay. Okay. Uh, well, I'm the middle of three girls. My mom and dad were pastors, and uh, but that meant nothing. Just because they were followers of Jesus, I had to find Jesus for myself, one yeah. on one. And at 16, um, I went to a youth camp, and I really didn't think I wanted to be Christian just because my parents were. But by Friday, you know what happens? The Holy Spirit works in your life all week in, in these youth camp experiences. And by Friday, I thought, I can't, and I don't want to live without him. And so I knelt at the altar of prayer on that uh, Friday morning, and I can still see the pastors that came around me that prayed for me. And the Lord and I have been walking together ever since I was 16, and I plan never, never to turn my back on him. Amen. We have two children. We have a son, Brady, who is in Youth for Christ Ministries full-time, living in Fort Wayne, and then our daughter, Amy, and their families here. It's a joy to have them in service this morning. And Michael, Xander, Abby, the baby somewhere. <laughs> Where are the babies? So it's a, a, a it's a what? It's, a <laughs> it's a joy to be here. We really look forward to being here. We don't know your pastor well. We look forward to getting better acquainted with them. And he and I have some things in common. We both work for Indiana Wesleyan University, and I'll talk a little bit about that in our sermon this morning. Great. Joy comes from a Christian home. I'm the opposite. I come from an unsaved home. My dad and mom. We're married for 50 years. My dad was an alcoholic for 50 years. You can imagine the dynamics of that kind of home. I was saved at the age of 13. Some neighbors invited me to church. And I already told you at 14, I was sanctified and called into ministry. And uh, you know, the Lord used that experience that I had in that difficult situation. I did not know what it meant to sleep through the night as a teenager. My dad would come in, two o'clock in the morning, cuss, swear, throw dishes, break things. It was a terrible, terrible time. But the Lord used it for good in my, in my life. Many times I have thanked God for allowing me to be in a home just like that. I learned things at 14 and 15. I've met people in their 60s and 70s. They haven't learned it yet. 
I loved him as a teenager, but I had to. I was forced to. God used it for good. Father, we thank you for these precious people. What a privilege to be in this place at this time. You know where we are? None of us are here by accident. We are here on purpose. We believe you're going to speak to us through your word, how we need to hear from you again. And as was already prayed, but we need to hear different today because we've been in your presence, your name. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. You know, in our lives, here's where we are right now. You're praying about something. It's kind of out here. Maybe there's a physical thing you're praying about or a decision or some really challenging time, but it's out here. And so you're you're here, but you're praying and you're, you're hoping this thing gets answered. But this time right here in between is what we're going to talk about today. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me easily? All right. This time is called In the Meantime. The Meantime. Have, have you ever been in a meantime? Do you know why they call it meantime? But it's a mean. That's why. It's a meantime. Well, there's a man in the Bible named Daniel, and he was kind of in the meantime. In Daniel chapter 10, he, he's praying for God to do something. As he calls upon God, he prays and he fasts for a whole day. Wow. Can you imagine that? A whole day. He prays two days. He prays a week. He prays 14 days. He prays and fasts 14 days. How many of you have ever heard of the Daniel fast? Okay, that's great. You know, the lions were the very first ones to ever participate in the Daniel fast. Wait a minute. They, they pray 15 days, 18 days. He prays 21 days, day and night, fasting. And finally, on day 21, Michael, the, the, there's an angel that comes through with the answer. And then, then here's what the angel says at the angel in chapter 10. We heard your prayer 21 days ago. If that had been me, I think I'd have said, excuse me. What do you mean? I mean, I've been down here these 21 days praying, and you heard me. Why didn't you get here? It has been no picnic praying and fasting these three weeks. And the angel said, when I left to bring the answer, I encountered this king of Persia. It's an evil spirit. And for 21 days, I've been involved in this spiritual battle. And on day 21, Michael the archangel came to my rescue, and I have broken through. I don't have time to preach to you today about angels, but I tell you, there's a spiritual battle going on in the heavenlies. These spiritual realms we're going to talk about a little bit today, there's a spiritual warfare. We are in a battle. We are in a war. And we know that, and the great comfort and direction that we can receive is from the Word of God. So I want to point out three scriptures this morning. I want to point out 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9. 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9. And then 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3 and 4, and Ephesians 6, 12. I'll repeat those scriptures again. But our first one is 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9, which says, Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Devour doesn't mean just to discourage or to tempt. Right. Devour means to destroy, to totally obliterate you and I. Uh, Resist him. This is our part. What part do we have? We need to resist him. We I, and stand firm in the faith. And then in 2 Corinthians 10, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3 and 4. For though we live in the world, we do not wage the war, war as the world does. The weapons that we fight with are not the weapons of the world at all. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Thank Amen. God. I cannot tell you, and I'm wondering if you're finding yourself at the same place. How many, how more, much more often I am praying and using that phrase, God, in your name, by the shed blood yeah. of Jesus, demolish the strongholds. It's just not discouragement these days. Uh, that the enemy is out to destroy our families, to destroy our children, to destroy our churches. Are you seeing it? Sure. So we have got to say in the word, we have got to pray the word, we've got to plead the word. There is nothing stronger in our life than we can do. In Ephesians 6 12, it says this Our enemy is not against flesh and blood. We know that. We're seeing that, aren't we, every day. But against the rulers, against the authorities, and against the powers of this dark world. Powers of dark world, yep, we're seeing it. Mm -hmm. And against all the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Those are powerful scriptures. They are, they are. Um, you know, Joe and I were in South Bend First Church a few weeks ago, and as I walked in the back, there was a man back there who said, Do you preach very long? 
And I said, well, it depends on how many amens I get. And I said, the more amens I get, the shorter I preach. And he went, amen, 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 amen. <laughs> So you're an even in a crowd, I can tell, right? Okay. Yeah. Oh, no. All right. I knew it was going to happen. Joy just spoke to you from Ephesians 6 about our struggle is not against flesh and blood. There's a spiritual realm that goes on. Satan and his demons are fallen angels. What are they? They are fallen angels. Satan and his demons are fallen angels. Satan is not omnipresent. He's at one place at one time. He's not in Indiana and Michigan at the same time. He's in one place at one time. Probably none of us have ever had a battle with Satan. We have his demonic forces, and we know what we mean when we read about Satan tempting us and all of that. He's working on the, some heavy hitters, I'm sure. But the point is, we are involved in a spiritual battle. Now, these, uh, these demons uh, are, are, are just fallen angels. And I think sometimes we think of Jehovah God here and Satan here. Cost. No, it's Jehovah God here, and then nobody over here. The counterpart to Satan is Michael the Archangel. He is the counterpart. So we find that Satan's demons are organized in a certain kind of rankings or hierarchical arrangement, or you might even say kind of a military style. They have their rulers, there's authorities, there's powers of this dark world, and there are these spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now, what, what are these different rankings among the uh, demons? First off, rulers. The rulers are generals. They are very high ranking demons, but remember again, they are fallen angels. Secondly, there are authorities. These are privates. They are a lesser rank. Demons who carry on conflict among men and women. Have you ever found any of them dealing with you? Conflicts? Powers of this dark world. Those are demons who have charge of Satan's worldly concerns. And then spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Scholars tell us these are the demons who focus on religion. Does it surprise you that a demon would focus on religion? We are at war and the devil's target is you. He hates the church. He hates believers. You're his target. Do you know that? But guess what? Pastor over here, he's the bullseye. Yeah. That's right. So we need to pray for our pastor, all of our pastors. Right. Staff, leaders, pray that God will watch over them. We need to pray for each other. We are in a war. It's a battle. We, we are facing things that there's only one way for us to get through it. How are we going to win this battle? There's only one way to win it. It's through the power of prayer. Much prayer, much power. Little prayer, little power. No prayer, no power. We have to pray. When I was younger, one of the things I always dreamed about doing was to become a school teacher. And uh, went to Olivet Nazarene University, became a elementary education teacher taught several years first grade and fourth and fourth grade and I thought that I when you when you find God's will you just get on this path and you just stay there until you go to heaven and you know the beauty of walking the adventure of walking with Jesus is he's so creative and he has so many things in his up his sleeve that we don't see at the time if I when I was 16 if God would have said someday you would be speaking out of the I don't think so because I was always an introvert, I'm a very, I'm very, I'm a very introvert. But the Lord requires and asks me many times to work in an extrovert role, and I do, and God helps me. But that's not my nature. But anyway, I love teaching. But one day when we were um, actually we were singing in the choir when we used to pastor in this area, and I felt the Lord speak to me. He said, I "said I want you to go to seminary," and I said. I, well, no, I don't think so. And I knew he was talking to somebody else. But we lived in, in, in Indianapolis. We were far from Anderson University. And so I didn't do much about it. And then I felt the Lord come back to me again. And he said the same thing. And then I knew it wasn't the person next to me standing in the choir. It really was me. And I said, are you kidding me? And I didn't share it with Lenny for quite a while. And then finally I did. I said, Lenny, I feel like the Lord is continuing to draw me and ask me to go to seminary. And I said, well, God, I can't do that because... I'm 50 and lots of my brain cells have already died. <laughs> and he didn't listen to my argument and he just continued leaving me. And so we went to Anderson University one day 
And Lenny said, well, let's just go check it out. Let's just go see what it's like. And we were just going to see what it's like. And I ended up coming home, having enrolled at Anderson University. And I don't know, I began saying, God, what are we doing? But the whole process, it was, a, it was kind of a challenge. We were pastoring uh, full time. Or we still had a daughter, a child. I thought it's a child at home. And I wasn't sure that that was a thing I could do. But all God requires for us is obedience. And there, I can't tell you how many classes I would say, Lord, what are we doing? What are we doing? And I just continued on out of sheer obedience. Well, one of the requirements in getting a Master's of Divinity is that they had us go through clinical pastoral education where you spent a, a semester in a hospital. And I remember saying, I don't think I want to do that. No, thank you. I don't think I want to do that. And they said, well, you have to do that your last semester. I began getting some training at St. Vincent uh, Hospital here in Indianapolis, and I, it ended up changing my life. I ended up loving that ministry. And so I became a hospital chaplain, and then I was ordained. And then uh, the very day, actually, that I was done with my training, that hospital, St. Vincent Hospital, gave me an invitation to come back there and to work full-time there as a, as a hospital chaplain. And I said, God, this is what you had in mind the whole time. Why didn't you tell me earlier? Well, he's not obligated to, is he? But the beautiful thing is as we obey today, he's going to be there tomorrow. And he has lots more in the future Amen. that he sees we can do and he wants us to do than he ever reveals to us in this day. Our blessing is to just live a life of obedience, piled upon obedience. Amen. So the first day I started my training, I started my new job at St. Vincent Hospital. My husband went in just for a routine procedure. He was supposed to go in that morning, supposed to come out that night, and it ended up being anything but routine. It became a 70-day hospital experience. He had a procedure done, he got MRSA, it went all through his body, it went into his heart. He had to have a heart open heart surgery. And I remember sometimes being on some of the floors above where his room was, thinking, when I finish my day, will I find my husband dead or alive? And I remember one day going to one of his specialists and saying, should I go home and plan a resurrection or should I go home and plan a funeral? And the Lord read on this, whatever you do, whatever discouragement, whatever you experience, stay in the word. Amen. That Amen. is our meat. That is our sustenance. And the Lord read on this scripture for me in Psalm 118, verse 17. 118, verse 17, it says, I will not die, but live and will proclaim that the Lord has done this. He will not give me over to death. And praise God. Amen. Amen. Grove City Church of Nazarene wanted to join and come there and share our story. And they have a professional video team there. And they sent that video team here to Indianapolis and uh, they wanted to do a dramatization of what happened to us years ago. This was back in 2007. So this video is very old, but it does capture part of the atmosphere that was around us in our lives during that time. I want you to see this. This is taken right at St. Vincent Hospital. Watch it. Hello, my name is Lenny Weissart. I went into the hospital a while back for a routine procedure. Matter of fact, it was an outpatient type of procedure. While I was there, I developed a staph infection. It became very serious. I was in a room just like this, as a matter of fact. This is the very room that I was in. I was in the hospital for two and a half months. When I got out of the hospital, I found out that my doctors had talked among themselves and said, when we have patients that are as sick as Mr. Weissart, they just don't make it. People all over the world were praying for me. I remember receiving an email from Israel where some missionaries said, Lenny, my wife and I, as we walk the streets of Jerusalem, are lifting your name in prayer. I know that many people from many churches were lifting my name to the Lord in prayer. But I also remember, though that was true, this room started to come in on me. When you have a place for two and a half months, it can get very, very small. And I remember saying, oh God, I feel so very alone in this room. 
And it was like God said to me, let him look around. There are hundreds of faces in this room. Well, I was in this room so very long. My wife, Joy, she was on another room. A room called the waiting room. While in the waiting room, you can imagine the questions that went through Joy's mind. She was wondering about well, what's happening to me. How long is it going to take? Well, they told her from the surgery would be eight hours or so. And you can imagine how long it would be to wait for eight hours to pray and think and imagine. Well, eight hours came and eight hours were gone. Hour number nine came. Then ten. Then eleven. And then twelve hours. Finally, the doctor came to Joy. Gave her the update of my situation. And some of the report was not good. I was as low as a person could be. That will cross again the United States. For doctors and nurses, God did a wonderful work in my life. The Lord touched me and brought healing to my life. You know, He also did something in my spirit. Our intimacy moved to a whole different level. I believe that intimacy will be a part of me the rest of my life. You can imagine how tiresome it was being in this bed day after day, week after week. I remember one day they got me out of bed. They put me in a chair right here beside my bed. This is what I look like. So I give you thanks, but I give him praise and glory. Our God is in the business of helping people go through the toughest stuff of life. I had what I call a miracle miracle. Half the things I hear people calling call miracles probably would have happened anyway. But I tell you, mine couldn't have happened. I couldn't make it happen. I couldn't work it out. I couldn't create the details. It had to be a miracle miracle. My main physician was a Jew. And I went and told him what Jesus did for me. You should have seen his face. <laughs> And he said, I tell you, I don't know about that, Mr. Weisshart, but I'll tell you this. You are a miracle man. A miracle man. And I let him know it was the Christ power in me, the prayers of God's people, that brought this healing. The power of God was released in my life through prayer and the people of God. Family, loved ones, people like you, people around the country and around the world were praying. I, I, I said Joy was in a, a waiting room. I was kind of in a waiting room, you know, being in the hospital. When you're in the hospital 70 days, you have doctors you see one time, you never see them again. Or they'll bring their students in because they want to look at this thing that has come to pass. And so they're looking at you, and, and you don't know whether there are a whole horde of doctors who would come in. But you know what? I, though I didn't know, God knew every doctor and every nurse by name. He knew where my room was. He knew all that was going on. Though I felt so very alone. You saw in the video, it said that there were hundreds of faces in the room. That was people like you who were praying. These people were lifting me to the Lord. There's always more going on in our lives than we can always see out front. When Joy and I pastored in Atlas First Church, we used to put on these massive musicals. You remember, Sean? Sights and sounds of the season. And uh, I mean, it would be massive. We would have 300 people involved in, in the setting up the, the, the scenes and the actors and all that. And, and I, I realized that at any one time, 300 people involved, but there's only 10, 12, 2, 3, 5 on the platform at any one time. There was always a whole lot more going on back here behind the scenes than ever came out front. Uh, yeah, I'll take a pizza with pepperoni and sausage, please. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, it's a busy place back there. Anyway, I'm going to say to you, there's always more going on behind the scenes than we ever see on the platform. There's more going on behind the scenes in your life and mine right. than we ever see True. out front. 
God is working all the time. Right. We serve a God who said, I will never. I will never. Everybody say never. never. I don't know what you're going through. We serve a God who said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Now, I was in the hospital a few days, said 70 days. I, I was in probably for about, oh, I don't know, 55, 60 days. And uh, I knew Joy was uh, the uh, chaplain on duty, 800 beds in St. Vincent Hospital. And she was the only chaplain on duty that night. And, uh, you know, during that time, I, uh, we, I touched her hand, held her hand, that was it. You know, all these, these weeks went by and, and it was just awful. Well, I thought, here I am. You told me my hand was awful? No, that was good. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> I thought her hand was awful. Yeah, no, 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 no. I wanted to hold the whole thing. I did. So good. But anyway, I, I woke up at 2 a.m. And I thought, you know, she's the only chaplain on duty. I have an idea. I called the front desk, the office. I said, hello. I tried to sound a little sick, you know. Hello, hello. I said, I, I, I need a chaplain. <laughs> and so she called me and she said, there's a patient in room 220 that uh, would like to see a chaplain. And I said, oh, I know him. He's very needy. <laughs> <laughs> I can go right to this room and minister to him any way I can. And so I opened the door, pushed the door open. You know, they just have low lights in the, in the evening when the per medical personnel wants to come in and out. But I opened that door and saw him lying in bed, just smiling and grinning as I entered the room. And so I came in and ministered to him. We talked for a little bit. And, uh, you know, as a chaplain, I, I, I'd like to pray with people. But, uh, you know, I, I said to Joy, I said, honey, you're the only chaplain on duty. You got a little beeper in your pocket. That's a little white jacket on. I said, all I have done for these 60 days is I touched your hand, held your hand. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. I want you to get in bed here with me here in the hospital. And she said, I sure like to. <laughs> no, <laughs> she really didn't say that. Okay, but anyway, so I did. So no, I know, I know. So I, I, I asked her to get into the bed. So she did. So I put my arm, you can imagine, I put my arm around her. And, and there was a, a, a CD playing, uh, Made Me Glad, that's the name of the song. You're my strong tower, my shelter, my help in time of need. That was playing all the time. Tears running down our faces. We were just trying to give God praise and glory right in the middle of that terrible situation. Right. But then I was left with a responsibility because as a chaplain, when you visit someone, you have to chart the experience. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going, now let's see here. And so I wrote down in the, in the chart, called on the patient in room 220, and I prayed with him. <laughs> that was all. <laughs> You can't tell them everything. No, no, no not at all. <laughs> you know, Joy, I made a conscious choice when I was in the hospital right. to thank God for that problem. Amen. I don't believe God caused it, Amen. but He was He's working at it for good. Right. Right. He doesn't cause your problem. But if you love Him, you're called according to His purpose. He's doing something. Right. He's doing something right. good. You need to hold steady. Through this time, so by faith I praise God in for and in this situation. You know why we? Why do we have these problems? God's good; He loves us. Why do we have sickness? Why do we have all this stuff? It's all because of the fall. You ought to thank God in Genesis chapter three. That's a very important chapter in the Word of God, and the, the, that that chapter gives us an insight as to why we have these trouble. The reason we have all this stuff is because of the fall. In heaven, I will not have glasses; I will have contacts. <laughs> but I'm saying to you, the fall is a reason we have all of this stuff. I learned so many things as a result of this challenge in my life. God taught me that I could trust Him when I couldn't feel Him. I love the feeling, don't you? I love the feeling. But feeling or no feeling, God is still good. I could trust Him even when I could not feel it. I'll tell you another thing he taught me, Joy, is that silence, you know, I talked about silence in the video, it's quiet. Not all silence is the same. Uh, I, I've been in a room before, nobody's in there, maybe the lights are out, I'm just in there thinking, praying, whatever. And uh, 
all of a sudden, without hearing anything, without seeing anything, I can tell there's somebody in the room. You with me? I don't know who they are. I can't hear them. I can't see them. They're, they're, I can tell there's a presence. And the Lord said, Lenny, there is a silence with absence. But there is a silence with presence. That's what I'm after. And that's what I had in that hospital room. There was a silence with his presence. Amen? Amen. 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 You know, this morning, uh, you don't often find a sanctuary in a motel room. But my, my husband had taken some things down to the car and I was in the room by myself. <clears throat> and I know God hears us whenever we pray. I don't doubt that. That's his rep that's my, my rep his reputation in my life and in your life. And I was praying. And then I began speaking. There is power released when you speak the word yes, of God. Right. And I began praying through Psalm uh, 16, just saying the words and applying them to my heart and, and just making them personal. I want to encourage you when you pray, don't always pray silently. That's good. But it's so much better to speak the words mm -hmm. into the atmosphere. Say the word, speak the word of God as you are praying. You know, one, there's two ways that God re, uh, reveals himself to us. And his, he demonstrates his attentiveness and his concern toward us in two special ways. One is through special revelation. One is through general revelation. In general revelation, God speaks to us through nature. In special revelation, he speaks to us through his word and through his miracles. The reason I'm sharing those concepts with you is here's another way that God showed himself mighty in our lives. When we finally went home to our house in the uh, yeah. yeah. circle, yeah. we were home that day after 70 days. We sat down at the kitchen table and we looked out our kitchen window and we saw something that should never have been. And it was a very busy backyard. We had a basketball goal in our backyard. Kids would come and play ball. We lived on a cul-de-sac. It was house, 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 house. And every house had lots of kids, two and three kids. So kids would run across our yard, our kids would run across other people's yards. Yeah, it was a very fertile neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was. So anyway, we always had kids, but, but this time of the day when we got home, there were no kids. There were no kids anywhere in the community, which seemed it, kind of unusual to us. But looking back, God was orchestrating how he was reveal, going to reveal himself to us. We were sitting at the kitchen table we were thanking God and praising God for him being with us. And I looked out the window and I said, Lenny, look. And right outside our window was a dawn, a doe and a fawn. Not a dawn. A doe and a fawn. Two deer right outside our window. That should have never been. And we looked at each other and we looked out and we thought, God is saying to us, I know where you are. Yeah. I know how to get to you. I can get you in any way I choose. Yeah. And that was one of the freshest, most precious ways that he revealed yeah. himself to you us. You know how, like when the when the doe would be eating, the father would be looking around. Uh, the father would be eating, the doe would be looking around. And the doe came right up to our window. How many of you have a dog at home? Anybody have a pet, a dog? Yeah. We, we do. His name is Moses. But anyway, he's not right. Okay? This, this doe came right up to our window. And you hear the dogs do this. I'm looking at this doe. And she goes, Have you ever seen your dog do that? You look at your dog and he goes, It's like he's communicating. Oh, yeah, I know what you're saying. That doe just looked right at us. I know where you are. I know what's going on. It was a precious, precious moment. And do you remember how long they stayed? Well, yeah. So sure. we started time it. It was at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. You know, here's this pretty busy time with kids and stuff. Nobody there. The, the, when we look at our watches, when, the, when, the, when they both left the yard, it was 5 p.m. They had been in the yard for four hours. Oh, my God. God says, I know exactly where you are. It, it, it was a general revelation. Yes, it was. Amen. It was so precious. It was so precious. You know, when we go through crises or difficult experiences or challenging experiences in our lives, 
we sometimes feel like, will life ever become normal again? Yeah, yeah. And I remember many evenings going home from my job at St. Vincent's the Hospital Chaplain and coming home so, so weary before he was uh, let go, before he was dismissed. And I remember lying down in the bed, I said, Lord, I just can't pray. I am just too tired. Not only physically, but weary in spirit. And the Holy Spirit taught me to say, and this was my prayer, God, I'm too weary, I cannot pray. Please hear the prayers of the saints yeah. that are praying for me. That's the beauty of the church, isn't it? That's the beauty of the community and the fellowship of believers. Amen. Just whoever was, uh, you asked for us to pray this morning for one of your members. And so we are praying, we, are not, we don't have to be there, but we can pray and send prayers out that God can go and make peace wherever he needs to go. Amen. I just thank the Lord. Sometimes when you go through things like this, you feel like life's passing you by. You want to ask, is this really happening to me? Will things ever be normal again? <laughs> I just want to say another time and encourage you, whatever, encourage you, whatever you do, stay in the Word. Yeah. Yes, the prayers of the saints are very, very important. Amen. And they uphold us and they sustain us. But the, the main meat, the main encouragement, the main direction we get is from the Word of God. Stay now, in the Word of God. Another thing I learned was you've got to live through your questions. Mm -hmm. You're going to have questions. You can't figure it out. You've got to live through your questions. In other words, you face them. Admit them. And live, and live your way to the answer. Here's a principle for life. You get something like that in your life, you can't figure out, face it and replace it. What are you going to replace it with? Thank you. The Word of God. Right. Have you heard anybody say, you've got my word on it? Uh, I entitled my book, You've Got His Word on it. That's it. Face it. Replace it with His Word. Now I'm going to give you five words here real quick that would be a great thing for you to write down. And if you didn't have anything to write on, put it on the person sitting beside you. Do something, okay? Here we go. When you have this kind of hurt in your life, grief, we need to learn to give your grief a voice. Give your grief a voice. Say it. Pray about it. Talk about it with some friends. You don't have to tell everybody in the world about it. But don't stuff it. Give your grief a voice. Another thing I learned, Joy, was that you can live victoriously in the midst of unanswered questions. I like to have them answered, don't you? Answer or no answer. You can be victorious regardless. <laughs> I praise God that that is true. Suffering is not anything we want to ask for, of course, but it's one of our greatest teachers. Right. It's one of God's greatest teachers. Where suffering happens, he reveals himself, he presses us in the end. And we, we see a, an accurate picture of our extreme need for him. That's the blessing of suffering. I don't want it, but when it comes, I know there are brand new truths and brand new treasures that I want to learn about God and his character. You know, illness is not, illness is not an isolated experience. If one of you in the family are struggling physically, emotionally, it's a family event. Amen. Even though Lenny was going through this, we all were going through it together. You know what I mean? It's not, well, they're sick and I'm fine and my life is going to go on as normal. No, illness is not a, it's, it's a family event. Family members, and I want to say a word this morning if you have ever been or are presently a caregiver. Caregivers, I don't know if you know, it's extremely exhausting. But I want to say to you, if you have been, or if you are not now, you may be someday. Or if you know someone who is a caregiver, caregiver yeah. I want to say that caregiving is kingdom work. Mm -hmm. sure is. Caregiving is kingdom work. Amen. Now, I, let me refer a couple times to Daniel who had lost everything. And any picture we see of Daniel in the, in the lion's den, usually it's Daniel not looking at the lions, but he's always looking up toward God. Suffering displays the true nature of who God is. We all face challenging circumstances, but never allow your focus to be brought down to the circumstances and say, this is who I am. No, that's not who you am. Your circumstances are not who you am right. at all. Right. Your circumstances are events that God has allowed for a reason. 
And you know this is not new news to you. You have two choices, to become bitter or better. If you become bitter, you're the loser. If you become better, the way to do it, as I've already said, is the person of Jesus. I don't think we'll have time to talk about this much this morning. But in 2021, Lenny and I got COVID. We got COVID, we were diagnosed one, one morning. By that evening, he and I were both taken away in the ambulance. Our neighbors found us, they realized that we were not letting Moses, our dog, out to go to the bathroom. <clears throat> so they, they got a hold of our children, and Lenny and I were taken to the hospital. Lenny was in a week, I was in a month. What COVID did to me, it caused my brain to forget how to eat and how to walk. And so he was out in a, in a week. Thank God he was there because that first week I don't remember anything. And he would come and feed me. And then after the, that week, then for three more weeks, I was sent to a uh, rehab through taking physical therapy. And to this day, my legs, my long haul COVID is my legs are weak. But thank God I am here. Amen. If Amen. you ever wonder, if you ever wonder if God does miracles, you just remember, take a picture of this morning and know that this man and this woman both have been resurrected, resurrected from death. And the yeah. enemy wanted yeah. to do away with us, like he wants to do away with you. Yes, right. But do not go there. Just continue to press into Jesus and stay strong in his word. I wanted to say this really quick. If you've got your pen and paper out. Oh, I, if you show me skip it. All right, never mind. I'm not going to say that part. Well, these are points. I, I like being practical. I, I like handles, so I'll say these really quick. What do we do in the meantime? There are three words. Remember, review, and repeat. Remember what you know about God for sure. I know God is a loving God. I know that he cares for me. And then I review his reputation. How has he worked in my life in the past? And then the, the last one is repeat the word of God that applies to your life situation. Hold it again, remember? Remember, review, and repeat. Thank you, I want to miss that. Remember Ephesians 6, 12, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. <coughs> it looks like it's flesh and blood. It looks like it's people. Yeah. No, no, no. It's, it's different than that. Our struggle, the word struggle in the Greek is, is, a, is a wrestling word. It's an up close combat, kind of a, a right in your face kind of a struggle. Remember I told you I thank God by faith for allowing the hospital experience. We did the very same thing with COVID. Here we are laying in the bed. Who knows what's going to happen? Thank you, God, for allowing this. You're going to work on the Well, when I was in the hospital there for those 70 days, after, after about two, a little less than two months, here I am in bed. And as far as I know, what the doctor saying, I'm dying. And I told you I grew up in an unsafe home. And my dad brought things into our home that should never be in a home. At 10 years of age, my little mind took a picture of something I saw. And, uh, you know, children are taking pictures all the time. Things you say and do, the atmosphere of your home, they're, they're, the words you use, they're taking pictures all the time. They remember. I don't know, I don't know, I'm not taking a picture, but it was there. I might take a picture. Now, here I am, decades later, in the hospital dying. This picture that I saw at 10, I have seen hundreds of times. And so here I am, late on night, could be deathbed. And this picture flashes into the screen of my mind. I'm already down. You think when you're about to die, Satan will let up a little bit. No, sir. He's going to be out after you all the time. I have a friend of mine at 94 years of age. He said, Lenny, I'm having temptations at 94. I have never had my entire life. Satan is very patient. He will wait a lifetime to get you. Then better go to church all the time, you baptize, remember singing in the worship team if you're a leader, even if you're a preacher. We have no guarantee. We must hold steady all the way through. But here I was, struggling, seeing this picture. Here I'm so weak. And I said, Oh Jesus, please, this picture that I have seen hundreds of times, take it out of my mind. In a moment. It was like I saw this dusty trail coming up to a, a rock ledge, just, just rocks making a, a, a bench. And I saw Jesus sitting there with all these children around him. But there was a vacant spot beside him. I ran down there as a 10-year-old boy. I sat right beside Jesus. And I can remember as if it was just a few moments ago. I put my little arm around his back. He put his great big arm around my back. And I looked up into his face and I said, Hi, Jesus. 
And he said, I love him. And when he did, the picture was gone. Amen. And it's been gone ever since. You understand me when I say to you, I'd have paid big money if I had had money. I'd have paid big money to get that picture out of my mind. But in a moment, God took it out. God used that hostile experience for good to deal with something I had dealt with for decades. Yes, I had a miracle miracle. I was in the meantime, and I learned these things in the meantime. I wonder, is there anybody here today who's in the meantime? You know where you are now, but you're praying about this thing out here, and you're you're in the meantime. Anybody like that? Anybody in the meantime? Anybody in the meantime? Anybody? Just one, two. Yeah. You're, you're in the meantime right now. That's what we're talking about here. All these things we learned. It was it was in the meantime. Now, if you're in the meantime, you don't have to try to think one up. You, you know. You know you're in it. It's there. It's right in your face. You may have been in the meantime in the past. But now you're in one right now. It doesn't matter your age. Here's where you are. Here's what you think God wants to do. And you're in between. You're in the meantime. It could be physical. It could be spiritual. It could be emotional. It could be some kind of an addiction. You know, we, we, we don't have time to go into it. We are bombarded with pornography today. Men and women are struggling with this. In their homes, on their computers. Drugs, sex, all this stuff. It's, it's a mess in which thing which we live. I'm saying to you folks, we serve a God who knows what to do in the meantime. I'll tell you what we're going to do. In our final moments together, you've been so kind and tending. Thanks, Pastor, for letting us come. Before we sing one word or even stand, we, we use the front of this platform as an altar. You can't kneel, you can be seated. Would there be one person here today who would say, you know, preacher, I'm in the meantime. I love the Lord. I'm trusting with this out here. Here's where I am, but I'm in the meantime. And I believe God is going to use some things in the meantime. And I want to come and pray about it. If that's you, just stand right up. Step out. Let's pray together. Just right now. Come. Before we sing one word, just come. Just be right here where we see it. Anybody like that? Just come. Don't wait for anybody else. You just come. Husbands, wife, they want to come together. Let me buy it. Just come. Come. Go on for the meantime. Come. Who else? Just come. Who else? But we, we prayed about what to preach. You know, a lot of things we can say. The pastor and us talking together, just the Lord brought this message to our hearts. Like, it's for somebody here. So what else? Just come. You're going through the meantime. We're going to pray about it together. Come. Come. Who else? I, I'm in the meantime right now. You don't have to go through it alone. He's going to help you. Come. We're going to talk to you about it. I need thee. Oh, I need thee. Every hour. So we trust you, Lord. We recognize that 
you're working for good. We don't see the good, but we trust you. We walk by faith and not by sight. So we called you, just like Daniel. 21 days he prayed and fasted. You were working all the time, always doing more behind the scenes than we could ever see out front. So we trust you. We have faith that you're working. So God, work in these situations. Right now, with heads bowed, eyes closed. So someone to say, you know, preacher, I didn't come forward. But I'm in the meantime. You won't call out my name. You won't embarrass me, but pray for me. Anybody like that? Just raise your hand real high. Any place. God bless you. Put your hand down. That's fine. Anybody else? I'm in the meantime. I have not come forward, but pray for me. One more before I pray. Anybody else? Now, Lord, you see these who have come. You saw the hands that were raised. We know that you're a God who's working in all situations for those who know you, for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. So we rejoice that there are answers that are already on the way. Hallelujah, you're a God who does all things well. Call to me and I will answer you. I will show you great and mighty things you do not know. We're calling to you here at the altar, those in the pew, that Lord, you will show them in the meantime. Hold steady, quote the word, pray the word, praise God, give him glory. You're a God who is working all the time. In the strong name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's sing it. I need, oh, I need every hour. Praise God that uh, for you 
Hallelujah. And uh, the fact that you feel some of this Jesus is here, whether Papa or not here or not. Yeah, yeah. So, and I felt him a lot today. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Amen. Amen. One of the reasons we have an atmosphere like this is because of this guy. I can tell he's spontaneous. He's just open to the Spirit's leadership. Isn't that wonderful? That's the kind of pastor I want. Anybody else? Every heart free? Everybody minding God? Well, I felt like the Oh, yeah. There you go. <laughs> Can you hear without it? Yeah. Yes. One of the things that um, I guess I want to say first of all, always stay teachable. Always stay teachable. Always stay teachable. One of the things that has impacted Lenny and I so greatly from the Asbury revival that happened in February, March, I don't want to ever get over it. Lenny and I just really enjoy each other. We enjoy being together. We enjoy talking. Sometimes we enjoy just the silence. But one of the things that the Asbury Revival has taught our hearts, and that is to say, Holy Spirit, teach us how to host you. Yeah. The Holy Spirit is here. He is here. And it's kind of like saying, you're here, so what do you want us to do or say or change or obey. I guess that would be the thing that I would leave at a church. Just say it all. Holy Spirit, you're here. Amen. Teach us how to host you. Yeah. What do you want done? Right. What do you want said or not said? So it's just a simple thing that, that the Holy Spirit has taught us. Is how, how to host the Holy Spirit. Yeah. One of the messages I'm working on right now is that we are presence carriers. I'm going to be speaking to a bunch of evangelists in a, in a few weeks. I think it's going to be my message. And as preachers coming in, we have to be presence carriers. You just can't kind of do what you think you do your thing. Forget that. We have to be presence carriers. People can tell if he's there or not. Amen. Let's stand together. That's going to be my final statement. I have found that the process is often the main purpose behind the meantime. I have found that the process, while I was in the hospital the whole time, God taught me all kinds of stuff. The process is often the purpose behind allowing the meantime. Amen. Lord, I thank you for these precious people. Pour your spirit out upon our pastor, every person here. We give you praise and glory for God who does all things well. In your name, I pray. Amen. If you're visiting here today and you're not a part of another church, you need to come back and hear our pastor preach. Yeah. Somebody was talking to me about that. Somebody was talking to me early in the service. He said, our pastor can really preach. <laughs> We're not sure about you, White's Heart, but boy, he can preach. <laughs> they didn't say that last part, but they were bragging on their pastor. So if you're a visitor, you come back. You want to hear what's happening here. God bless you. You're dismissed.